In this screencast, we will cover the topic of neural integration. This topic may be found in chapter 11 of your textbook. And here are our learning objectives. Define neural integration and explain its significance. Contrast spatial and temporal summation. Explain presynaptic inhibition and explain synaptic potentiation. Appreciate that it can take up to half a millisecond for a presynaptic cell to stimulate a postsynaptic cell at a chemical synapse. When you take in consideration uh, the action potential coming down, then opening calcium channels, and then the vesicles containing neurotransmitter merging and dumping the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, the neurotransmitter diffusing through the synaptic cleft and finally binding receptors on the postsynaptic cell, that can take up to half a millisecond. So a significant amount of time. So the obvious question is, if synapses increase the time it takes for transmission of a nerve impulse from origin to destination, so in other words, if it, if those synapses really take a lot of time for one neuron to communicate with a receiving neuron or for a sending neuron to communicate with a muscle cell, why have them at all? Why not? just to let an action potential move directly from the sending neuron or to the receiving neuron or muscle cell. The answer is these synapses allow for neural integration. In this figure, we're looking at millivolts across the plasma membrane on the y-axis and time here on the x-axis. Recall that the resting membrane potential is negative 70 and that threshold is negative 55. So there has to be a depolarization from here to here in order for an action potential to occur in a receiving cell. Well, an excitatory postsynaptic potential is only about point five millivolts and it lasts for only about 15 to 20 milliseconds. What that means is it takes about 30 excitatory postsynaptic potentials happening about the same time in order to get a cell depolarized from the resting membrane potential all the way up here to threshold. And this figure here shows what I mean. One excitatory postsynaptic potential only depolarizes the cell by a very small amount. So you have to have about 30 occurring in quick succession to get all the way from negative 70 here up to negative 55 in order for an action potential to occur. Also take into consideration that some neurons may be releasing neurotransmitters that open potassium channels or chloride channels, and those are going to have inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, making it less likely that the receiving cell or postsynaptic cell will meet threshold. So it's the integration of the effects of all the neurons synapsing with a postsynaptic cell that will determine whether or not that uh, receiving cell produces an action potential. So you can sort of think of these excitatory postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials as being yes and no votes respectively as to whether or not a receiving cell or postsynaptic 
neuron generates an action potential. So it's the integration, the neural integration, or the combination of all these inputs from multiple presynaptic cells that determines whether or not the receiving cell or postsynaptic neuron generates an action potential. So you can think of a synapse as a vote in a way where certain neurons are releasing neurotransmitters that are going to cause excitatory postsynaptic potentials, which basically are a yes vote. I want the postsynaptic neuron to generate an action potential. And the uh, neurons that release neurotransmitters that open potassium channels or chloride channels cause inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. And that's basically the no vote. And if there are enough uh, excitatory postsynaptic potentials after subtraction of the inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, enough to get the uh, postsynaptic neuron to threshold, an action potential will be generated. And this is the basis of neural integration or combining the inputs of multiple neurons from multiple neural pathways to arrive at a decision by the uh, receiving neuron. So going back to that scenario that I posed at the beginning of our discussion on the nervous system where someone's driving along trying to get to class in the morning and they hit uh, intersection where the light turns yellow and then they have to decide okay do I hit the gas and blow through it or do I stop some of the things that are taken in consideration are well how fast am I going how far away am I from the intersection uh, what are the consequences of being late um, have I recently received a traffic ticket and therefore that memory has me a little gun shot all of this is going to be considered in deciding whether to go or whether to stop. And it's all the inputs of the various neurons at these synapses that's responsible for this complex thought and decision making. So ultimately, there are going to be neurons, motor neurons, that are going to activate the muscles of the leg, causing them to hit the gas or to hit the brake. The actions of that motor neuron are going to be dependent on all the inputs from these other neurons, right? Maybe these neurons are connected to memory, right? And, and they're like, oh, no, don't blow through it because, you know, we just got a traffic ticket a couple of weeks ago and we got five points. And if we get more points, our insurance is going to go up, right? But then there are these neurons over here that's like, oh, we're going to be late for class. We can't be late for class again. So we got to get through this thing, right? And then you had, and, and they're receiving inputs from all these other neurons right and so this is the basis of neural integration so that's why we have these synapses they allow for complex uh, decision making and thinking yes it slows down transmission say from here to here to here and then to the effectors but um, they allow for um, the combining of inputs from different portions of the nervous system. And just to give you an idea of uh, the magnitude of neural integration, for you just to read the words on this slide, there are some 40,000 synapses in your brain that are involved in this process. So if EPSPs and IPSPs are votes on whether or not a postsynaptic neuron should generate an action potential, you could think of the term summation as referring to the tallying of those votes. So in other words, how do these 
EPSPs sum, right? That is build upon one another in order to get from the resting membrane potential all the way up to threshold so an action potential can be generated. One way those postsynaptic potentials can be summed or tallied is over time or temporally. And this process is called temporal summation. So in this example, we have one presynaptic neuron or one presynaptic axon, right? And if action potentials are gener being generated in quick enough succession, it's going to be releasing neurotransmitters in quick enough succession to such that there are enough EPSPs being generated over time to get that postsynaptic neuron from the resting membrane potential to um, the threshold. So these are excitatory postsynaptic potentials being summed over time. Another way that the postsynaptic potentials can be summed is over distance, right? So you could have a uh, presynaptic neuron here, another presynaptic neuron here. They're both releasing neurotransmitters and they're both producing ex uh, excitatory postsynaptic potentials. Down here, here you have, you know, one is coming from here, the other one is coming from here, but they both are combining to get you to this. So in other words, you can have these EPSPs can be caused by different neurons in different locations. Here we only have two, but you could have five or six or seven or 20, etc. And so you've got EPSPs coming, resulting from the release of neurotransmitter from multiple presynaptic neurons at different locations on the uh, cell. Another concept of neural integration that I want you to be aware of is presynaptic inhibition. This is where one neuron actually suppresses the effects of the presynaptic neuron on the postsynaptic neuron. Let's look at the following image. So here we have a synapse, like all the other synapses that I've shown you, right? Here's our presynaptic neuron. This is the uh, axon terminal, of course. And here's our postsynaptic neuron here. But what we also have is a additional neuron that is synapsing with the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. So here we have an axonic synapse. So currently an action potential is coming down and then it's causing the release of neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter then binds to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron causing an excitatory postsynaptic potential. Here we have our same synapse. We have a, an action potential that's coming down into our presynaptic axon terminal, but there's no release of, of neurotransmitter and therefore there is no production of a EPSP on the postsynaptic cell. Why is that? Well, it's because action potentials are moving down the axon of this inhibitory neuron and causing it to release inhibitory neurotransmitters that cause inhibitory postsynaptic potential on this axon. And so it basically counteracts the effect of this action potential. And so it's inhibiting the release of neurotransmitter by the presynaptic cell. 
and that's why we refer to this as presynaptic inhibition. The inhibition is occurring before the synapse of interest. Lastly, let's talk about the concept called synaptic potentiation. This is where repeated or continuous use of a synapse results in a greater than production of excitatory postsynaptic potentials than expected or previously, right? So think of normal as the before, right? So let's say we haven't used this, this synapse hasn't been very active, right? So for we get this, for this many, this much in terms of action potentials, we get this much neurotransmitter released, right? And we get, you know, a certain amount of sodium entering the cell. So we get a certain amount of excitation right, or excitatory postsynaptic potentials. However, after repeated use of this synapse, right, because we are um, studying something over and over again, or we're doing some type of routine that we just started over and over again, over time, what we find is the same number of action potentials results in a greater amount of sodium entering the cell and therefore a greater excitation or a, a, a larger than expected excitatory postsynaptic potentials in the receiving cell. So what's responsible for this synaptic potentiation? In other words, why are we getting a greater response in our postsynaptic cell um, after repeated use of that synapse or continuous use of that synapse? Well, the synapse changes. It changes such that for the same amount of action potentials moving into the axon of the presynaptic cell, we get a greater amount of neurotransmitter release. And in the postsynaptic cell, we can also get a greater expression of the receptors. So more neurotransmitter, more receptors, greater excitation. And this is the basis of synaptic potentiation. Synaptic potentiation is one of the ways that the brain changes and it allows us to learn. It can learn, allow us to learn a new skill. Uh, or like, uh, you know, maybe shooting a bow and arrow or riding a bike. Why is it that at first it's difficult to ride a bike, but the more you do it, the more familiar it becomes, and then it becomes almost a habit. Well, it's because the synapses that are involved in riding a bike, right, when you first start riding them, right, right they look like this, but then over time they look more like this. And the same thing can be said with um, other forms of learning, right? Like you try to learn someone's name, and so you say their name over and over again to yourself and over and over again to yourself, and then eventually you're able to learn it, right? Or uh, some concept in anatomy and physiology, as I tell you often, you know, you'd say it over and over again, right? Literally, the synapses in your brain change. That is why, one of the reasons why practice makes perfect. The more and more you do something, the more these synapses are rewired to make um, performing that task easier. So synaptic potentiation is part of neuroplasticity, and that's basically the reorganization of neural pathways. And that's how we learn. That's how memory actually develops. Your brain changes. When you learn something or when something becomes a part of your memory, it involves the re, it literally re, involves the rewiring of your brain to increase the speed and, and efficiency of neurotransmission across the synapses that are involved in that memory or in that learning. We're now at the end of our screencast, so let's review the learning objectives. Define neural integration and explain its significance.
contrast spatial and temporal summation, explain presynaptic inhibition, and finally explain synaptic potentiation.